Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. When they brought him liquid, you know, it was because he was thirsty. So I think it was a natural response. So I believe Jesus is expressing all the frailties of humanity and our dependence upon him. Now think about it. Here he is on the cross. Probably he could have had uh, brought a rain shower and stuck out his tongue and grabbed some rain. I, I, there's a lot of weird stuff he could have done. But he did something that most normal people would do. When you're thirsty and you can't get to the liquid to re- refresh you, you will ask someone who's nearby who you believe might be able to help you bring you some liquid. Would you mind doing this? Honey, you're in the kitchen. Would you bring me a drink of water? Honey, I left my on the back porch. Could you bring it in? So you kind of do it when you're thirsty and you can't get to yourself. So I look at that and I think, good for you. Jesus was all God, but he was also man. Here's a list of some of the things that he expressed in his humanity. He was happy. It was that joy of Jesus. I don't see him laughing, but there was a joy. Thirsty, hungry, grieved, sleepy, groaning. So there's a lot of different humanity parts about him. So he died expressing all of that, but also that there was an element of dependence. And so let me speak to you and me on the hope that we have today. If Jesus could do that in his humanity, that tells me that I don't have a God like so many of the man-made gods and religions for millenniums. They create their gods, they write all these pithy little statements, and these gods kind of move out of eternity somewhere. They're so far away, they're so distant. I have a God who is the only God who died and paid my sin debt, but he's also a God who is intimate with me. He's acquainted with me in all forms of grief, all sorts of temptation, although he didn't follow that temptation. He still had all of that. So I have a God that when when he says, I care for you, Stan, I know he doesn't do it in some oh existential way. He really experienced all of this, and he really feels my pain. I I can connect to a God like that. When he says he loves me, and he knows what I'm going through, I want, to, I want to pour myself out to them. Let me just show you how that fits into just humanity, the DNA of humanity. Most of you are aware that they have different support groups out there. They have the support groups for those who are alcoholics. They call them Al-Anon, I believe that's called. They get together. They're trying to overcome their alcoholism. So they're sharing with it, and they feel more comfortable because you know what it's like to be drunk. You know what it's like to lose a family. You know what it's like to be without a job. You know what it's like to have all this pressure chemically to get all of this stuff. And then they have those that deal with drugs. They have those that deal with gambling. They also have those that have problems with talking all the time. And that group is called on and on and on. That's a little humor there. Just let that go. The point I'm trying to make, though, simply is that we feel more comfortable around the people that we're with. When pastors get away, we tend to relate better and let our hair down because we know what you're going through. We know what it feels like when a family you pour your life into and they leave. Or We know what it's like when you just don't have enough money to build that building you want to build. We know what that's like. And I'm going to tell you, when you know that Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I didn't sin. I don't have to know your sin. I don't have to be a horse to judge a horse show. But he says, I can feel that pain. I I am so glad I have a father like that. But I can tell him that I too am hungry. I I would like this. I need this. The Lord says, I love you for that. But there's something else it tells me too. It tells me that um, I need to not be so dependent. Jesus could have said, all right, the cloud comes, out goes the tongue, and in goes the little raindrop. He didn't do that. He was basically saying, by his example, I'm thirsty, implying, can you bring me something? Now, he didn't ask for it directly, but I'm thirsty. He made the need known to see if people would step up. There are some personality styles, and sometimes I'm like that, that um, I'm doing something, and, and Carol will say, can I help you? And I don't know what it is, but maybe it's the competitive spirit. Maybe I'm just warped. My, the phrase I'll use is, I can do it myself. I can do it myself. And Carol will remind me that when, I, when she was getting ready to marry me, she had a long conversation with my mother, and my mother gave her about five things that you're going to hear from Stan. And this goes back 46 years. I can do it myself. I, I really can't do everything myself, and I can't do a lot of stuff myself, but I always want to think I can do it myself, and I like being by myself. Did you catch that? I like being by myself. When I was a child growing up, I was bullied a lot. Now, I didn't get the crud beat out of me and all of that, but I just felt non-accepted. And after a while, you did, okay, I, I, I like myself. Remember the old song? 
I hold myself, I think I'm grand. I go to the movies and I hold my hand. All right? I put my arms around my face. Myself, when I get fresh, I slap my face. I'm a nut. Anyway, enough of that. So much so that as I grew in ministry, it became easier to just surround myself with a small group of people and then tell myself, I don't need a whole lot of people. And the neat thing is I've got guys in my life that say, Stan, you need to be around other people. We talk a lot about that with my little support groups and, and put it on my goal list. And I have to tell you, God really has worked in my life that I really enjoy being around others. I enjoy, when I can be there, I want to be there. Now, certain things demand you to have to be by yourself and getting things done. And most everything I know that's a task, listen to this, listen to this. Every task that you do, taskmasters, is still connected to people. Don't ever forget that. Something of that task connects them. You need to do that. And then about a month ago, I came across a verse that I read that reminded me of Jesus again in this passage. And it's found in Proverbs 18.1. And I'll just read it to you. And it goes like this. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. When I read that, I thought of that little old man who sits on his porch and every kid that walks by and steps on his grass. Get off my grass! Get off my grass! And then I got thinking about all those hermits back in the field, way back in the forest. They don't want anybody around them. It's kind of like, just want to be by myself. And they're usually angry, old, grumpy people. They're selfish. And what Jesus is saying is we need one another. And there's a litany of verses. And those of you that will preach what I'm preaching here and you want to expand on it, this will be the time to put in all the verses that says one another, pray for one another, admonish one another, love one another. All the one another principles because we need one another. And Jesus exemplified that even when he was on the cross. I'm thirsty. Implying I have a need. You've got to tell people you have a need. And when they meet that need, receive it in Christ's name. Number six. And that is uh, John 19.30 when he said, It is finished. At the end of his life, Jesus made that wonderful pronouncement. It is finished. Jesus died completing the work God gave him to do. I'd like to say this phrase to some of you. <clears throat> it's about finishing. We could end our life one way, but it's another thing to finish our life. I can end it, but not really finish it. Here's what I mean. We live in, in um, Kulio'o, and we come down the valley on a Sunday morning in December when the Honolulu Marathon is on. And so then we turn right on Kalani Highway as we head into town, and there are literally thousands already at 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning that have made it to Kuli'o'o heading towards Waikai and around that part of the island as they're all coming. And as we're going, they've, they've taken the four lanes and they've reduced our lane to one lane, and the other three lanes are dealing with all the people that are coming and running. They've got all the banners and all the tables filled with cups of water, and people are cheering, and there's all sorts of lawn chairs everywhere, and you're watching and you're hearing this as we're heading into church. All this is happening. And we've done this for, I don't know how many years, we've lived up there six, seven years now, and every year you can just see that and all the color and all the people running and you see these guys and then you've got that guys in the wheelchairs and they're just going to town. And then after the service, we leave here about 1 o'clock and we head home. Now it's about 1.30. We get into on, on Kalani Highway and as we do, it shuts down to a crawl because they're now taking away all the cones and we think, oh, the race is over. And as we do it, we're now watching these people. And if you have ever seen the people at the end of the Honolulu Marathon, it's the most pitiful yet encouraging sight you'll ever see. We've seen them grabbing the walls as they were just, and they're, they're still going forward. They're not even heading back. I, I, so why am I telling you this? Everybody ends the Honolulu Marathon. Everybody does. There's nobody still running from December, but not everybody finishes it. Did you catch that? We will end our life, but I wonder if we'll finish this the purpose for which God called us. For when he said, it is finished, what he was really saying was, I'm dying now. No, he's really saying, I fulfill that which you called me to do, Father. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that whole gamut of theology is, I came to take upon me the sin of the world, be the appropriate sacrifice for this, die the appropriate prophetic way that I was told to die, go through all of this to satisfy the payment for mankind in your eyes. And he says, it is now finished. There's no more that I have to do to complete the task God has given me to do. David said that uh, 
he finished his life and the purpose that God called him to do, and then he died. So why am I telling you that? Well, my take-home point from this is very important. My principle is I don't want to just end my life. I want to finish my life. I want to make sure that my life really has meaning and purpose. So here's a question you have to ask you. Ask yourself, why are you here? You know, why are you here? Now, some people would step back and say, well, you're here to win souls. I get that, and we should. But if that's all we're supposed to do, how do we eat? And how do we go to the grocery store? All we do is win souls. So the winning the souls comes out of a lifestyle of separation unto the Lord. And wherever we are, we're doing something for the glory of God. So now, are you in God's calling? So maybe you're asking yourself, I don't know what my purpose is. You know, I want to finish what God called me to do, but I don't know what God called me to do. Very simple. Look at your spiritual gift, because God often gives you a spiritual gift as an enablement to accomplish something special that God wants you to do for his glory in building up the church. But secondly, you want to look at your heart. What really gets you excited? What makes you sing, so to speak? What's your abilities? You know, some of you have got certain really good abilities. I don't have, I wish I was an artist. I can't even do stick figures, and you can tell if it's a man or a woman in my stick figures. I'm that poor at that. I don't have that ability, but I do have some abilities. Here's a phrase. I can't do some things, but I can do some things. So you all have an ability. But what's yours? What is the one that you found easy to learn and to do? How about your personality? Are you outgoing? Are you passive? Are you task? Are you people? Find out the combination of that because that will fit into your life. That's your natural motivation. Your spiritual gift is your supernatural motivation. And your abilities is the things that you can do in your life to touch other lives, serving them. But there's also one more, and that's experience. And that's something that is very unique. These are the things that God has purposed into your life, prescribed in your life, or permitted to come into your life that shaped you. That's an experience. I, I've never gone through a divorce, so I've never experienced that. But some of you have. And so now you can use whatever that pain and separation and embarrassment or whatever you went through and how God used that to rebuild you to make you a fully devoted follower of Christ. He can do that. Some of you have been in a horrible, grinding automobile accident and you've lost a loved one through all of that. I've never experienced that, but you have. God permitted that in some measure to shape you so that you could discover your purpose to be used for the glory of God. So find out what it is and then you give it to the very end of your life. And then on the cross, your cross, you can say, not, my life's ended. No, it's finished. What's finished? Not your life, but your purpose. So I would encourage you to figure out what that might do, be for you. Here's the last one. And this one I find to be so much important to me. And it's Luke 23, 46. And it says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So the principle is Jesus died trusting himself to the promised care of God. I love that. I can trust the Lord for anything and everything. And so I'm going to trust him with my entire life. So my hope for today is, if Jesus, watch this, if Jesus can trust God the Father, I should be able to trust God the Father. When I was in Bible college, they said, if you can trust the Lord for eternal life, you ought to be able to trust him for a hamburger, huh? <laughs> and so the same thing is true. I think all of you probably have trusted Christ as Savior, but my real question now is, can you trust him for the day-to-day -day things you need in your life? And that's what Jesus did. And it was at a time he didn't really need food or another cloak, he was at the very end of his life, and he trusted his entire life, the entire being. Watch this, watch this. And the final results in himself and the promised care of Father God. Now, if Jesus could do that and did that, could we do that? So my question to you now is, what do you need now to trust the Lord to do for you? Sometimes they're going to be very huge. It's going to be, what's going to happen to my career? What's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen? Will I get married? Will I ever have a baby? Will my body ever function the way that it should? Will I ever get out of debt? Will I ever find the church? Some of these that are going to another place. Will I ever find a church? And so you have to trust him. Big things like that. Some are little. This morning you heard already that Carol and I are leaving tonight, 1 o'clock in the morning, tomorrow morning actually, to China. You know all that. What you don't know is that I went online today to make sure my tickets were in order to get my whatever you need to do to check in, so to speak, because it's within that window. When I did... I put in my reference code. Nope, you're not registered. I put in my e-ticket number. That didn't work. I said, okay, maybe Carol's got it. So I did Carol's. Nope, that isn't it. I did everything I possibly could, but I am not at all scheduled to be on the flight tonight. And this plane only leaves the island like two times a week to get us to China to all of our speaking engagements and all of that. 
So I thought, well, what am I going to do? Well, you have to trust the situation to the Lord. And I told the men on Wednesday night, we call this an Indiana Jones adventure. We move forward and we let God, just whatever he does. So I called our travel agent. They're closed. No recorded message, no nothing, no emergency. No. Okay, so I have their email address. So I sent one blind email and said, help. And then I said, here's the situation. I'm going to the airport anyway, just so you know. And of course, once we're dropped off at 10 o'clock tonight, who am I going to call at 1 in the morning when we find out we're not on the flight? You, probably. But anyway, Dennis, probably. <laughs> but anyway, get back to this. 15 minutes later, I got a phone call and an email and said, we've already done the work. You are confirmed on the flight. Something was wrong with this, that, and the other, but you are there. Don't worry about it. Get on the flight. Why am I telling you that? That every one of us will have sometimes daily, sometimes multiplicity of situations a day. So our heart is, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you with this, but I can't trust you with that. Watch this, watch this. We have to have a heart of trust. So when it comes, it just becomes an easier thing to just give back to the Lord. Just give it to the Lord. I told you about the last sayings of those who died. I've been impacted by many books. You go up to my library, I have thousands of them, biographies of the hit, but this one is such a tiny little book. Your kids could read this, but I wouldn't encourage them to do so because it's, it's so um, dramatic. It's only 78 pages long, and it's called China, Christian Martyrs of Just the 20th Century. Let me read to these, read some little phrases of last statements of Christian martyrs before they died who owned the last seven statements of Christ, particularly his last one. Listen to this one. This happened in the late 1900s. The governor announced that the men would die first of the missionaries. The governor, a wicked Chinese governor. George Farthing, one of the English Baptists and the father of three children, stepped forward. His wife clung to him, but he gently put her aside and he knelt before the chopping block without a murmur. His head, his head fell with one stroke of the executioner's song. The other men were killed one by one, then the women and the children. The farthing children hung on to their mother and had to be pulled away when she was ordered to kneel. Mrs. Lovett was permitted to hold the hand of her little boy, quote, her last words, fully devoted follower of Christ. We all came to China to bring you the good news of salvation by Jesus Christ. We have done you no harm, only good. In a strange act of gentleness, a soldier stepped up and removed her spectacles before she and her, and her son was beheaded. News that the Boxer army was approaching, quote, Our way, it is cut off, the Alliance's Carl Lundberg wrote. If we are not able to escape, tell our friends we live and die for the Lord. I do not regret coming to China. The Lord has called me and His grace is sufficient. The way he chooses is best for me. His will be done. Excuse my writing. My hand is shivering. Six days later, he added to his note, the soldiers have arrived and will attack our place. The Catholics are prepared to defend themselves, but it's in vain. We do not like to die with weapons in our hands. If it is by the Lord's will, let them take our lives. Another one for you that are younger. Little Lizzie Atworth. She wrote her to her family on August the 3rd. Dear ones, this is her last words. I long for a sight of your dear faces, but I fear we shall not meet on earth. I am preparing for the end very quietly and calmly. Here it is. The Lord is wonderfully near. He will not fail me. I was very restless and excited while there seemed a chance of life. But God has taken away that feeling. And now I just pray for grace to meet the terrible end bravely. The pain will soon be over, and oh, the sweetness of the welcome above. My little baby will go with me. I think God will give it to me in heaven, and my dear mother will be so glad to see us. I cannot imagine the Savior's welcome. Oh, that will compensate for all these days of suspense. Dear ones, live near to God and cling less to earthly life. There is no other way by which we can receive that peace from God which passes all understanding. I must keep calm and still these hours. And then she too writes, I do not regret coming to China, but I am sorry I have done so little. My married life, two precious years, has been so very full of happiness. We will die together, my husband and I. 
I used to dread separation. If we escape now, it will be a miracle. I send my love to you all and the dear friends who remember me. And then it says, 12 days later, when they're out of the area, the guards came and murdered the seven missionaries. And it goes on and on and on. These were not superheroes. These were people that sat in churches just like you're sitting in this church here and heard a message maybe similar to this. And they finally came to a crux in their life where that they run, recognized Jesus went through all of this, but then there was that glorious resurrection. He is who he claimed to be, and he did what he claimed to do, and he did it forever and for you and me. And so they gave their life to Christ, and it wasn't just, I'm going to trust him in this, but not that. I'll, I'll go here when it's bad. It was their whole life was one, so wherever God called them, that was their purpose, that they ended their life by saying, it is finished, even if it was their head rolling around at the bottom of a chopping block, only to be gathered up with the other heads of the missionaries that were then put into a big cage in the public square so all the people could see. You say, I'm being overly dramatic. No, I think sometimes we need to have reality ranch sometime in our beautifully air-conditioned cars and wonderful scenery here in Hawaii. These are people just like you and me. And my prayer is that all of us would come to a point of full surrender to the Lord. And that no matter what God calls us to be, a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, or a martyred missionary, that we'll live our life for Christ to the fullest. I'm going to read these seven statements and then we're going to close. Number one, here's how to live this life. You are to live forgiving those who sinned against you. Two, you are to live giving the truth to those condemned souls who are lost around you. You are to live loving selflessly and being compassionate about those whose pain may be less than yours and making sure their needs are met. You are to live understanding the serious implications of sin and its separating power. You are to live not afraid to admit your weaknesses and to allow others to meet your needs that you might build the strength of fellowship. You are to live not until your life is over, but until you but you are to live to finish the work God gives you to do. And last, you are to live and die trusting your life and your death, your soul, and your eternity to the hands of a caring and promise-keeping God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you have proved yourself altogether lovely, but also altogether faithful. That even at the very end, You are true to who you are. And all that you said has tremendous impact for us. And just like it rallied the troops for San Juan Hill or the Alamo or the War of 1812 with their famous statements, that our famous cry would be, Remember Jesus Christ who was crucified and rose again for us, our Savior and our Lord. I pray that, Father, with that, that we will embrace you as our personal Savior by faith alone and not by any good works, knowing that nothing we do could ever give us eternal life. And if it was by good works, we wouldn't need forgiveness then. We need forgiveness because it's not by good works. We're so desperately lost, hopeless, in need of a Savior. And then you, the crux and the crucifixion and the resurrection. So, Lord, thank you for that. I pray that if there's anyone that's listening to my voice right now who hasn't trusted you as their Savior, that they at this very moment in their own heart would fully embrace you by faith. They would trust in you. Believe what you said, that if we trust in you, we have eternal life. Take you at your word and just leave it there, knowing that you are a God-making and a God-keeping that can do everything you can with our promise. And so, Father, we promise now in our heart we're trusting you because you've promised once we've done, you've given to us eternal life. Now, Father, in a moment we're now going to serve this communion time and this is a sense like the crux of it all. This is what you did before you walked that painful walk carrying that cross after you were bloodied and basically butchered. And then you went to the cross to make these seven statements. And so today, Father, as a faith family, we're receiving them because we do know that there is the resurrection and we have now resurrection power. Father, we pray this 
In your precious name, amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.